Thank you all so — thank you all so much for being here. And, and let me begin by thanking my colleagues uh, to my left and right behind me, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor O'Malley, for being here as well. I also want to recognize the guy I always embarrass him, the superstar of our administration, Arnie Duncan. He can play basketball, but he also can — he knows how to love a lot about education. Arnie, it's great to see you here, our Secretary of Education. Also, the president of the AFT, uh, Randy Weingarten, who's an old friend here, and the president of the NEA, Dennis Van Rokel, is here as well. I welcome them both. And I'm told we have some Metropolitan Police uh, — hey, guys, how are you? Uh, — who are always looking out for us around here. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think we get in your way lots of times when we're getting back and forth going home, but thanks for all the help. And uh, also, I'm told there's a number of school teachers and a number of people here in the audience who uh, are uh, working, thank God, now, uh, uh, at least in part, if not in whole, because of the investment the American people have made through the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So, uh, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is, I want to thank, as I said, Governor Schwarzenegger and, uh, and Governor O'Malley. These two guys represent all that's right about the Recovery Act. Uh, and let me say at the outset here, the Recovery Act I'm going to talk about and why it's worked, but it's also because it's so unprecedented. It's shifted not only opportunity, but real burden on governors in terms of the transparency, the requirements of reporting, and the difficulty that I caused them all by being such a uh, — uh, so engaged. Uh, and, uh, and so what I want to thank them both and their colleagues, the other governors, uh, for uh, their cooperation. You know, the Recovery Act, I think, has helped pull a number of states out of crisis and put them on a path to a stronger future. This is not a recession they caused. This is a recession they inherited. This is a recession the governors inherited, and it was a worldwide recession. It wasn't merely a local recession. So, you know, they have very, very critical and difficult jobs. And they're going to tell you a little more about how each of their states uh, um, has responded to the crisis they found and how, in fact, the Recovery Act has impacted on their ability to deal with the crises they've inherited. You know, it was eight months ago now that, uh, that the President uh, signed the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And uh, he termed it — he termed it — it's important to remember this. It's not the only thing we've done in the economy. He termed the Recovery Act the beginning of the end of the Great Recession that we faced. And we call it a Great Recession, not to engage in hyperbole. It's the worst recession America has ever faced, short of a depression. So unfortunately, it was the greatest, meaning worst, recession we've had in American, modern American history, short of a depression. He called on, I quote, the beginning of what we need to do to create jobs for Americans scrambling in the wake of layoffs, and the beginning of what we need to do to provide relief to families worried they won't be able to pay next month's bills, and the beginning of the first steps to set our economy on a firmer foundation, paving the way for long-term growth and prosperity. And today, eight hard months later, we're on our way to accomplishing all of those things. Now, don't get me wrong. The President and I know full well that there is too much economic hardship that remains. My grandpa used to have an expression from Scranton. He'd say — and I mean this literally. It wasn't viewed as a joke. He'd say, Joey, when the guy in Dixon City, a small town above Scranton, is out of work, it's an economic slowdown. When your brother-in-law is out of work, it's a recession. When you're out of work, it's a depression. And it's a depression for millions of American people. And we're not going to be satisfied until we see a net creation in jobs in every monthly report. But we're moving in the right direction. We're starting to make real progress on the road to recovery. We're no longer talking about whether or not we're going to slide into depression. We're arguing and talking about the shape of the recovery. And that's a gigantic change in eight months. There is a strong and mounting evidence that the Recovery Act is putting people back to work. Just listen to the stories you saw in the video. I was at every one of those places except one. I met every one of those people. I spent time with them. This is real. And this can be repeated thousands of times across the country. It's helping Americans get through these really tough times. Just ask the more than 16 million people who have received expanded unemployment benefits. Where would they be? Those who criticize us, what would they have done? 54 million Americans 
who received economic assistance in jump-starting the spending, $250 one-time payments to veterans and to the elderly. Ladies and gentlemen, it's laying the foundation for recovery that God willing is sustainable, not based on a new bubble, not based on a dot-com bubble or on a housing bubble. Just look at our investments in broadband and smart grid, high-speed rail, renewable energy, green jobs. Quite simply, the Recovery Act is operating as advertised. Again, my grandpa, it wasn't advertised as the only horse to carry the sleigh to get us out of this ditch, but to play an incredibly important role. It's performing as advertised. It's playing its part in lifting Americans back up and moving us toward genuine recovery. Unlike when we took office, we inherited at that time a GDP, a negative GDP of 6.4 percent that quarter that we took office. By the way, before, Governor, we dropped our right hands after taking the oath, already the month of January, 700,000 people that month had lost their jobs. Now what have we heard? This month, again, a lot of people still in trouble. When you're out of work, GDP doesn't mean anything to you. Doesn't mean anything to you. And we get it. All three of us get it. The president gets it. But yesterday, the GDP was announced grew. It grew by 3.5%. It hasn't grown that much since 2007, over two years ago. The economic forecasters have attributed, and by the way, left, right, and center, they've attributed the vast bulk of this growth to the Economic Recovery Act, the much maligned and battered Economic Recovery Act. Put another way, without the Economic Recovery Act, it's very unlikely this economy would have expanded at all this last quarter. It may have even contracted. Look, this is further evidence that we're no longer talking about, as I said, whether or not we're going to recover, but instead, what shape is this recovery going to take? But as I've said repeatedly, it's not good enough. Less bad is not good enough. GDP, GDP growth is absolutely necessary precondition, but it is not sufficient. It is not sufficient to meet the goals the President and I set and I'm sure both my Republican and Democratic colleagues behind me feel as well. We're not going to be satisfied with an increase in the GDP. We need real leaps forward and opportunity for working class people, middle class people, people aspiring to get into the middle class. We don't want to just grow the economy so we can just stand here and say we grew the economy. We need to make sure that when it does grow as it is now growing, that the middle class comes along with it. The middle class benefits. That means jobs, and not just any jobs, but decent paying jobs. Jobs upon which you can raise a family. Jobs in which you can have some sense of security. Jobs that will form the foundation for the new economic growth and competition of the 21st century. The reason we're here today is more than a single purpose. The reason we're here today is to meet the commitment I made to you all when the President put me in charge of this to assure the American people that this unprecedented investment in the midst of this great recession would be totally transparent and we would be accountable for every penny we sent out there. And also to let you know, in the first quarter of the reporting, the first report that we're making, we're going to make subsequent reports, that we, in fact, what the progress has been, what has been the consequence of the investment made so far. We're also here to offer tangible proof that we're actually beginning to keep our promise of creating or saving jobs. Hardworking Americans are filling the jobs. Some of you right in this audience are beneficiaries of that. And the hundreds of thousands of men and women are receiving a paycheck now that they would not have otherwise been receiving at this moment. Let me tell you a little bit about the reporting process first. All along, we've been working with governors like the guys behind me, I've been holding weekly telephone conferences with the governors. I think we've at least, each of us, talked a couple times on those conferences, plus other times we've had the chance to talk a lot about this and a lot of other things. We've been working with private companies as well, private companies like A123 in Detroit, which received a grant to build lithium-ion batteries to power electronic vehicles of the new century. By the way, 
being personal for a second, my home state of Delaware. The GM plant was shuttered, closed, done, gone. For sale sign went up in the plant that used to employ in its heyday as many as 50, 000, excuse me, 5,200 people, making a decent wage, living in a decent neighborhood with real hope. Well, by the time it closed, there were 1,000 plus working there. Well, because of this new technology and because of some help from the federal government in a loan, a lot of investors were willing to take an e even bigger chance than we were taking on them. And Fisker Automotive just bought and is opening up this plant. We'll be employing over 200 people, and 2,000 and 3,000 in your home state. So folks, this is real stuff. A century ago, Solyndra, which you heard a little bit about, which you saw in the video, and has breakthrough technology for building solar panels that will help reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and lead us to a cleaner energy future, they also made an investment. They took a chance beyond us being willing to take a chance on them. We've been working with mayors and county executives, Indian nations, working with research groups, universities, universities, basically anyone who has received a federal dollar to initiate a specific project or activity as a consequence of this Recovery Act. And under the law, they all have to report. They all had to report in by October 31st of this month to tell us exactly where those funds that we sent to them have gone, how many people they've hired as best they can discern that, what projects are actually being done, completed, and what the stage of the projects are. Folks, and then our independent recovery board, there's 10, a group of 10 IGs, inspectors general, headed by the toughest guy in, in the government that we picked, and he really is. I mean, he, was, he had a reputation of being really very, very tough, heading up nine other IGs to go out there and go through with a comb each of these reports. This is the accountability part. This is the transparency piece. And based on those reports, which we've received to date, the net results have been quite positive. As a result, I'm pleased to announce that the Recovery Board has advised us when the data is posted later today, it'll be posted about 2, 3 o'clock today, when it is posted today, it will show that we have created or saved 640,239 640, jobs directly as a consequence of contracting authority of the federal government. We still got a long way to go, folks, but for those 640,000 Americans and the hundreds of thousands more who have received jobs as a consequence of the indirect investment we've made, when we go in there and we invest in people getting a recovery, uh, that $250 uh, um, one-time payment, the tax cuts that exist for small businesses, the tax cuts that exist for individuals who receive a paycheck and have withholding, getting 60, 80 bucks a month more. That endeavor has had the macroeconomic impact of creating at least another 400,000 jobs, separate from what we're reporting today. So I can say, and without my, in fear of being contradicted by any responsible source, that so far, so far, we have created over a million jobs. You know, uh, the fact of the matter is we know that more jobs are on the way and will continue as we continue to spend out these dollars. We're only about a third of the way through this marathon. This is not the final report. This is the first detailed report. Plus, it doesn't even count, as I said, for those jobs that are created by the more than $175 billion in stimulative measures, including tax cuts, small business loans, Pell Grants, unemployment insurance, all those other aspects of the money that's gone out to the states and to individuals. Every dollar being spent in the Recovery Act is helping put someone back to work. If I could hold up just for a second here, here's the deal. Think about this. When someone is getting another 60 to 80 bucks in their paycheck, when someone's getting that one-time payment of 250 bucks, it means they go to the sandwich shop, they get their hair done, they walk into the local drugstore, they walk into the local hardware store, and they're able to spend money for things that they need that wouldn't otherwise have been spent. That means there's the clerk that stays working. That means there's the waitress that's still on the job. That means, that means employment. Not only do they get direct benefit, but when that money goes into the economy, that 100 plus billion dollars, 
it saves and creates jobs. And by that investment in the economy, as I said, investment in the economy, we have saved or created another 400,000. That's how we get to the million. So 640 directly from a contract going out to a university or a, a government contract put out to pave a road or renew a rest stop in a, you know, in a, uh, uh, in a national park or whatever. That's a lot. That's a lot of jobs. Now, people will say, well, Mr. Mr. Vice President, we've lost 10 million jobs. Well, that to me, seems, as a consequence of this great recession, a significant portion of what you lost before we even took office. Well, that's like saying, so what difference does it make? Well, let me tell you, to the million people who have those jobs, it makes a giant difference. It means the difference between 10 million and 11 million unemployed. And things are beginning to move as a consequence of the other aspects of our economic policy. I was talking to the governor in California, which got clobbered their housing market. Home prices, you told me, Governor, just actually started to rise for the first time in a long time. 36 months in a row, homes lost on balance 30 percent of their value. Housing prices were dropped by 30 percent. Things are beginning to change. Governor O'Malley ha has even a better story of what's happening in his state in terms of employment. Look, here's the deal. Uh, I think this is helping to put us back on track to meet the commitment that I made on in, in front of this podium, behind this podium, uh, seven months ago, that we would save or create at least 3.5 million jobs by the end of next winter. That's how this Recovery Act spends out and pays out. <clears throat> and what we're going to see today, though, is that to be able to go home, you can go home, and any of, the, any of the listening audience, you can click on a website to get the best estimate of all the receipts we've gotten from everybody reporting in. Their accuracy has been checked and rechecked by the Independent Recovery Board. And folks, these are real results, real paychecks going to real American families in every single one of the 50 states in our territories, real workers like Jamie, the police cadet in St. Louis you heard about, Richard, the teacher in Florida, Lori, uh, the small business uh, um, owner and employer in Reno. You know, and their stories prove these are that there's not, these are not just statistics not just reports that exist uh, on nothing but paper or an outline. This is the real thing. This is what the recovery looks like for more than one million women and men in the United States of America. They're filling good jobs. More than 80,000 construction works are throwing on their hard hats to build an infrastructure badly in need of repair, I imagine. Even if we did not have this great recession, we should be investing in this infrastructure. Approximately 325,000 education workers are in the classroom today, ensuring that we once again can lead the world in education and not leaving our kids come up even shorter than they have been as a consequence of this Recovery Act. Governor Schwarzenegger may or may not choose to speak of that, but he's told me the stories about the effect in his state on education. Nearly 10,000 guys and women wearing a shield are on the job, on the streets, keeping our children safe because of the investment made in the Recovery Act. All in all, we've got more than 50, 57,000 different reports from universities, organizations, governments on the website you can click onto, each one telling a very powerful story. Just go to recovery.gov and check it out for yourself. Punch in your zip code, anybody listening. Go down to the street corner. There's a crosswalk where they got in that city uh, $1.2 million to make it safer. And you know, press on the intersection of 7th and James. Go look. Find out whether or not that money is being spent wisely. Find out who the contractor is. Find out how much money is being spent. Find out when the first spade of dirt was turned. Find out what the completion date is expected to be. Check it out. Making this amount of information available to the public in this level of detail, this quickly, is quite simply something that has never happened before in the federal government. And both of these guys have led in this in their own state. Matter of fact, we're trying to catch up with O'Malley's model, literally, in Maryland. I'm serious. Literally. 
And so, folks, this is an unprecedented undertaking. And we know, we know that it's not 100 percent accurate. This has never been attempted before. And that further updates and corrections are going to be needed. But we're pleased. We're pleased to make this information available publicly and so promptly as part of the unprecedented commitment that the President made to accountability and transparency. This is not only an unprecedented report, it also contains, as I said, some very positive news. But there's still, there's still more than a year left in this act. There's still plenty of work to do, plenty of families to help, plenty more ways we can make the economy stronger and must make it stronger. But my message today is we're on track. We're on track. And by the way, remember when this all started, a lot of the press legitimately said, well, as one ma major columnist said when we announced the act sitting in my office with four other columnists, he said, well, Senator, or Minister Vice President, tell me, what's going to happen when you plant 10 dead trees in Central Park, was her example? I said, then we got to plant 100, 100 good trees in a park in some other city. Folks, all the talk about all this stuff was going to go to, you know, $24 million to polar bear exhibits and frisbee parks. Well, so far, thank God, that's a dog that has not bitten yet, okay? Because of the incredible staff we've assembled, not only to insist on, not only insist on what is legal, but what can pass the smell test. As I said before, we believe that by the end of next year, the Recovery Act will have created or saved 3.5 million jobs nationwide. And, uh, and as we do, we'll continue to collect uh, and post these reports every quarter so the public can follow up in progress. We're going to learn from every reporting how we can do the reporting better. So we invite your comments if you think we're not doing it the way in which is the most transparent, literally, not figuratively. As I said to one of the, uh, the IGs, I said, look, you'd do me a great favor. If you see something wrong, let me know so I can announce it. And he looked at me and he said, that's a novel idea. <laughs> well, we mean it. That's the only way we're going to gain the credibility of the American people, gain back the credibility of the American people. So every American can see how we're matching our, our, our way and, excuse me, marching our way toward, uh, toward fulfilling the promise we made eight months ago. Now, look, uh, one of the guys who I find to be one of the most stand-up guys in the country, and you never have to worry about him leveling with you, and this is a guy who just wants to get things done, practically get them done. I haven't seen a partisan uh, bone in his body yet, and this is one tough guy, believe me. He's in the other team, uh, and, uh, and he is, uh, he's not reluctant to say uh, what he thinks, but it's a great pleasure and one of the great privileges I've had to get to know him. It's a great pleasure for me now to introduce the governor of the country of California. It's bigger than, <laughs> it's bigger than all but I think seven other economies in the world or something, literally, uh, um, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. But you left nothing for me to say anymore. You said it all. But anyway, I want to say thank you very much to Vice President Biden for inviting me here, right along with Governor Malley. It is wonderful to be here, and I just want to say that I uh, came here enthusiastically uh, to be part of this uh, press conference and of this event here today, simply because I am so excited and so happy that we have this economic stimulus money that is coming to, the, uh, to our state of California and to all the other states, and it has helped us so much. Uh, as uh, the Vice President has said, that we have hit uh, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, and I totally agree with him on that. And of course, I'm very happy uh, to hear the numbers that the GDP is uh, going up by 3.2 percent. So this is great news that I've heard this morning. And uh, but I mean, the fact is that the whole world is one third uh, less worth, you know. And I think that we feel that the economic crunch in California, the, the, the crisis that we have with the mortgages and with uh, refinancing, the budget cr crunch and crisis that we have. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have faced a tremendous uh, burden in our state. And as a matter of fact, our deficit this year, just to show to you, has been $60 billion. $60 billion is, is much higher than in any other state. So when you have to make those kind of cuts and also raise taxes and go through this kind of uh, a roller coaster ride, and then you get this help from the federal government. I tell you, it has been very welcome. And so I just want to talk briefly about this stimulus and what it has done for California. 
And the reason why I also wanted to be part of this is because there's some people, some of our colleagues that are saying it hasn't done much or it was a waste of money. Well, I would dispute that because for California it has done a lot. Uh, just to date, California has been awarded more than $12.5 billion of that stimulus money. And we have been promised $50 billion, so we're looking forward for the rest of the money. We expect that the federal reports, <laughs> no, because it was always made clear that this is uh, done over a period of two years, so we are looking forward to the rest of the money. <laughs> we expect that we expect that the federal reports to show that this money has created or saved more than 100,000 jobs in California. And this is also what our numbers show, because we have also uh, you know, counted the jobs, uh, and uh, it's really extraordinary the impact it had. We also expect the report to show that the stimulus dollars uh, have created or saved more jobs in California than in any other state in the United States. For example, take education. California has received $7.1 billion for education. Now, that money has created or saved 62,000 teachers' jobs. But not only teachers, jobs also for administrators and professors. So there's again people that said, well, we would have done something about that anyway. No, these teachers would have been gone if it wouldn't have been for the federal stimulus money. I just want to make sure you understand that. We have received also more than $2 billion for infrastructure that has created or saved more than 1,800 jobs. And many more infrastructure projects will be breaking ground in the coming weeks and months. We have received also more than $500 million for workforce development that has created or saved more than 12,000 new jobs. And also we have received money for green technology, which of course is very important for California since we are number one in green technology. We received money for that and that has created a lot of jobs. And there's great action also like this happening all across the state. Uh, and, and we are very happy about this help. We also share the administration's commitment to transparency and accountability, which is very important. That is why California, we have created a recovery task force, launched a website uh, so the taxpayers can see exactly how stimulus dollars are being spent. We were the first state in the nation to appoint an inspector general uh, to root out waste, fraud, and abuse of the stimulus funds. And that is not, uh, you know, uh, something that is a democratic issue here or a Republican issue, may I remind you. This is a people's issue. This is a jobs issue. It's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. That's what we want to create, and that is the most important thing, is to create those jobs and put people back to work. And uh, so I just want to say again, thank you very much to the Vice President, uh, Vice President Biden, and thank you very much to President Obama for helping the state of California, and we're looking forward, as I said, to many more help in the near future. Thank you very much, thank you. Well, I can assure you, Governor, uh, there is uh, more help on the way. And uh, one of the reasons why, uh, again, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate the cooperation of the governors, particularly the two men standing behind me. Um, again, folks, this is — they've had to handle an unprecedented — an unprecedented crash in their state revenues. I mean, it's unprecedented. And uh, it's amazing what they've done. Now, the fellow I'm about to introduce to you, he's seen more of me than he has wanted to see. We've been friends for a long while, but I'm, I mean this, I'm not being solicited because he's an old friend of mine. I think, I think a great governor. You know, he has really, his state has led the way in this transparency piece. I mean, he has done, uh, I hope we can replicate nationwide exactly uh, what he has done already. And the other thing that he's done is the governor of California has as well, but what he has done, and we've done a number of events together, and uh, he's filled me in in detail, he has really, really focused on making his state a green state. I mean, he has focused on it in a way where, again, he's made some real tough decisions internally about when you got to cut, what not to cut, what to cut. So it's really an honor to be here with Governor O'Malley, and, uh, and I'd like to give him the, uh, the platform. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Good being with you, huh? Thank you. Mr. Vice President, thank you very, very much for your leadership, and you are always welcome in Maryland. And I, I please return early and often to echo uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. It's a great honor to be here with you as well, Governor. I think both of our states share uh, uh, 
uh, some things in common, a talented, creative, innovative people that are unafraid of the future and that are willing to rise to the adversity that faces us. I want to thank Vice President Biden and also especially thank President Obama for taking quick, decisive, and courageous action against this recession to get our country moving again. It was only nine months ago, in their first 28 days in office, they passed the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And all of us remember in those times, all of the economists were talking about whether or not we were teetering on the brink of the next Great Depression. Now they're all talking about the road to recovery. How quickly will we come out now that we have made this, uh, these investments. Uh, I, I uh, shudder to think where any of our states would have been had President Obama and Vice President Biden and our Congress not acted to make these important investments at that critical juncture to get our country on the road to recovery. I also want to thank Mr. Vice President. There is in the audience today a number of Marylanders who uh, not only from our State Highway Administration, but also from the private contractors who do the public's works, like uh, Pierce Flanagan's and, and Sons, and, and their dedicated employees, men and women, black and white, who work hard every day to build the infrastructure that makes Maryland go, like 404 on the Eastern Shore, I-83 up in Bal Baltimore County, uh, the Maryland 650 uh, project here in Montgomery County, uh, which was the first recovery project to break ground. In Maryland, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars, I can tell you, have been critically important to everything that we're about, especially in tough times, of strengthening and growing the ranks of uh, our increasingly more diverse and upwardly mobile middle class. It has allowed us, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act has allowed us to create or save over 14,000 jobs in the state of Maryland. That's direct, induced, and uh, indirect jobs. It has helped us to continue to be able to extend health care coverage to more people rather than fewer. We've added an additional 45,000 children to the ranks of those that are receiving health care benefits. And it's allowed us to keep teachers on the job in what was recognized this year by Education Week magazine as the number one public school system in the United States of America. We know that these dollars are working because without them, there would have been 1,800 educators and teachers in our state who would, we would not have been able to afford to pay this year. We know that because of the hundreds of health care workers that are still on the job in Maryland. We know because of the 4,500 people whose jobs have directly resulted from the Recovery Act and because of the 8,000 induced jobs and because of the millions of dollars that were sorely needed, as you pointed out yourself, Mr. Vice President, to invest in our roads, invest in our bridges, not to mention the new classrooms so that our children have the skills to compete in this global economy. Under the uh, Reinvestment Act, Maryland, like every state in the nation, was required to submit some very, very detailed data on where the dollars have gone, what was the result of those dollars. Uh, our progress depends um, on our ability not only to set goals, but it depends on having leaders of the courage of President Obama and Vice President Biden, who have the courage, and, and make no mistake about it, it takes political courage to measure performance and do it openly, do it transparently, having the guts to tell the people for whom this government is supposed to work where their dollars have gone and whether or not it's getting the result that they should expect from it. And that's what President Obama and Vice President Biden have done. On behalf of uh, the other governors who were unable to join us here today, I really want to thank you, Mr. Vice President, for engaging with us, for being on the phone with us week after week, helping us figure out how we can do this in an open and transparent way. Uh, not only will uh, I believe this Recovery Act is not only working, uh, not a doubt in my mind that it's working, but it's also doing something else. It's showing us as a people that with openness and transparency and performance measurement, we are still capable of accomplishing great things. And that's an investment that will pay dividends for years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. So folks, <laughs> folks, I want to make it real clear. We could have done everything, and we don't do everything right. We could have done everything perfectly right, as, a, as Secretary Duncan knows, at a federal level. But the implementation of all this has been the governors, the mayors, the county executives, the people on the ground, the school boards, 
And it has been actually remarkable so far. I don't want to exaggerate this again. I want to make it clear. We're trying to do this as, as dispassionately and as surgically as we can. We don't want to make claims that this is the end of all problems. We don't want to make claims that this has done more than it has done. But without this investment in the Recovery Act and Reinvestment Act, without the governors taking on the kind of responsibility they did, have taken on, we would not, we would be in a lot, lot worse shape than we are today. As uh, Secretary Duncan can tell you, there's about $100 billion of this within his jurisdiction. And uh, he has been, uh, he has really had the ability to deal with an awful lot of innovative people in the states. Not only has he have had great ideas, not only have uh, the teachers been cooperative, but there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot going on here. A whole lot going on here. And let me conclude by saying that uh, the point that, uh, that Governor O'Malley made. One of the things I said, and by the way, as these guys, God love them, they do it. Once a week, every week, since the act began, I'm on the phone with five to seven governors for 45 minutes to an hour, and somewhere between seven and 12 mayors or county executives. I've now spoken to every governor at least once, and I think 20 or more twice in these conferences, and it's a two-way deal. I tell them what we expect and I ask them what they need. And they tell me what they need and they tell me what's working and not working. We've learned a great deal from those conversations. And I must tell you, I have yet to find a single governor who at the end said, by the way, don't send me any more of this help. We don't want any more of this help. Send double. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So folks, this has become, whether or not, how, no matter how it's advertised, this has actually become a bipartisan undertaking. I mean, it really has in its, in its implementation. And I thank the Republican governors as well as the Democrats. I was on with two leading Republican governors uh, uh, day before yesterday, actually Wednesday, for the 45-minute call. And even one who announced initially he was opposed to this was saying how much difference it made in the state. There's legitimate debate about whether or not exactly what we're doing in economic recovery is the right thing. There's different views ideologically how to approach this. But this is all about, when the, when the President asked me, put me in charge of this, to me, and the thing I have in common, not, I'm not as good as these two guys, but the thing I have in common with both these guys who do it every day, is we're looking for practical, practical, practical outcomes that affect the lives of the American people. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The longest walk any mother or father can make is up a short flight of stairs to their child's bedroom to say, honey, I'm sorry but you're not going to be able to go back to the same school next year. Honey, I'm sorry. You're not going to be able to play in that team because dad or mom just lost their job or, or we lost our house. We can't pay the bank. A lot of people have made that walk this year. My dad made that walk when I was third grade going into fourth. And I remember him walking up the steps. I remember exactly what he said, literally. Got to move, honey. I can't take you with me now. You're going to stay here with Grandpa and Grandma, my mother's grandfather, my mother's father and mother. I'm moving down to Wilmington with Uncle Frank. There's jobs down there, but I promise you, honey, I'll come back. I'll try to get home on the weekends, but we'll get a job. I'll get a job, and we'll have a nice place to live in. I'll come back and get you and Mom, and uh, and 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 Frank, and excuse me, and Jimmy and uh, and Valerie, and we'll be okay. I believed it'd be okay. It was kind of wrenching, but I believed it'd be okay. But it wasn't until I got older I realized. What an incredibly difficult thing for my father to do, to turn to his father-in-law and say, Ambrose, look, can Gene and the kids stay here with you? It'll be about a year. My father, like all these people who lost their jobs, was a proud man, a proud man. Not till I got, as I said, to be an adult, I realized how incredibly difficult that must have been for him. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, my dad has an expression. He said, you know, Joey, a job's a lot, about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. Folks, a lot of people have had their dignity stripped from them through no fault of their own, women and men. A lot of people have made that walk. Some are still making that walk in Delaware, California, Maryland. And we're not going to be satisfied. And I never speak for governors, but I'll bet they agree with me. We're not going to be satisfied until all those people have made that walk are able to turn around and say, 
and look at the kids and say, honey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. That's what this is all about. That is the measure for us of whether or not we will have succeeded. Not the fact that GDP may grow at 6.5 percent, God willing. Growth in the GDP is necessary but not sufficient. And I can't tell you that what I've learned about all these governors, I've never been a governor, I've been a senator for 36 years. These guys do this every day. These guys see these folks. They see them. They see them unlike those of us who work in Washington. And these guys not only are smart, they got a heart too. And so uh, I just want to thank them both for being here. I want to thank all the governors uh, for cooperating with me and, and our staff and all the mayors and county executives because they are where the rubber meets the road. They're where the pain can be seen and felt every day. And we're going to keep fighting until everybody has their job back and we're reporting that we created, instead of losing 200,000 jobs this month, we've just created 400,000 jobs this month, or 500,000 jobs. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. And we're going to play hell in the meantime, making sure we do get there, because we are not going to step back from this. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.